Hey everybody, it's Keanu Reeves. Don't worry about the red pill or the blue pill. If you want to take your mind somewhere else, you've come to the right place, Nick and Steve and the vocal minority. It's a whole other dimension. These boys give you two podcasts every week. Peace in the Middle East. Now we're all calling for peace in the Middle East. And thank you, Keanu Reeves. Keanu the Diplomat. That's always good. Did you ever uh, decide which pill you would take? Uh... It's a great question, honestly. Uh, I mean, the living life in the uh, the dream world in the Matrix is probably probably the better option, quite frankly, than the apocalyptic hellscape that the real world was in those movies. But I do love those freaking movies so much. I mean, the first Matrix was epic. The second one had a lot of great stuff. The third one was a little weak. The fourth one they did a year ago, a couple years ago, is is weak. But it's so funny because my my firstborn, my daughter, changed their name to Neo, and everyone always asks me now, like, "Oh, you named your kid after Keanu Reeves?" I'm like, "Actually, no. Like, I am a fan of the Matrix, but no, I did not do that. My my kid changed their name to Neo." So, and even they said, uh, "There's no relation, right?" No, Neo is like Latin for new, and that was you know. Uh-huh. Part of the, the rebranding that my firstborn wanted to go through. It was so I funny like it. when Kennedy told her daughter that my daughter's name was Neo. She was like, Neo? Like the Nazis? Neo Nazis? <laughs> <laughs> that Who never are you dating? <laughs> no. no. Never thought about it either, dude. That's crazy. Well, uh, something that is also a little bit crazy the vocal minority with Nick and Steve. Welcome to the podcast, dude. Uh, see our webpage, thevocalminority.net. Yeah, and see our social media stuff. A lot of, uh, a lot of views going on with the videos, a lot of commentary. And, uh, you know, you liberals, I see you liking things and reposting it, but don't don't leave it all up to me to argue with these idiots. Go ahead and jump there. Some of you have, but I could use a little extra backup. And uh, don't forget to call our comment line 844-48-VOCAL. Yes, indeed. Back again with another episode. And uh, speaking of Kennedy, things have been going very well in that relationship. We've passed the six-month threshold. Ah, uh, this is uh, Steve's one and only true love. Uh, he has been seeing her around his homestead, dude, uh, where one makes two, multiply love by the power of two, bring her into your house, have her cook for you, have her sleep with you, and uh, you'll rub on her in the morning, and maybe you'll pop a bone. These are all great things of relationships, in my opinion. Yeah, uh, we have been uh, cohabitating more of late. That is for sure. She uh, she has a new job that is closer to my house than her, than her current home, so she's been hanging out here half the week. And you know what? I, I, let me just let me just start off this story actually with a. Uh, I have a news story that I had pulled for our need to know news, but I didn't get to it. But it sort of ties into this whole you know cohabitation and huh? happy uh, you know happy relationship sort of stuff. Yeah, no, bring it uh, to the forefront. Everyone wants to be happy in some sort of relationship, I'm assuming. Yeah, and uh, we've got some relationship stuff we're going to talk about on the podcast today, so uh, stay tuned for that. But let's just start it off with this. Uh, Katy Perry dishes on the exact moment and how she rewards her partner for cleaning up around the house. Is this a struggle you have at your house? Do you do more cleaning or does Rachel do more cleaning? How's your balance there? Uh, it's about 95 five uh, and that is only because uh, uh, she's the breadwinner in our household so I have to you know I should take it on a responsibility she doesn't want to work hard when she comes home if she's been working hard all day right no that makes sense I don't get rewarded <laughs> you know I mean I guess I do I take that back but I don't get rewarded like I think you're talking about yeah it, it is debatable actually whether you should be rewarding your partner for these things like do you just tell them you appreciate it or do you go above and beyond and does that some set some weird precedent of now we're constantly rewarding each other for good things or do you feel snubbed if you don't get rewarded or whatever so funny that you talk about often as being i haven't dated in a long time and you have uh but talking about how there's guys out there that make this so easy for people like us and for other guys that like so you clean the kitchen up and now you're getting a reward for it or whatever like that's just shit i do that's just stuff you do i know that for a fact so to be rewarded like you need that i'd like it but i don't need it like yeah i think there are certain things that you guys should just be balancing in relationships and there probably should be some level of balance and you know good communication and telling someone you appreciate things that's you know that's usually the the gold standard but boy Katy perry she really goes above and beyond Katy perry said that uh, a partner who doesn't help around the house 
is a big red flag for her. She hates a guy that doesn't clean. Which, first of all, you don't think Katy Perry can afford a housekeeper, huh? Well, she's trying to live a normal life, Steve. Uh, you know, she wants to uh, be normal. Come on. Well, and her fiancé is Orlando Bloom, a Hollywood actor. So you're telling me these two really clean their own house? Yeah, that's crazy. With all the money that they have, I'd never clean again. It's not anything I would miss. <laughs> right. But Katy Perry, uh, that is a big red flag. A guy that doesn't clean and... Uh, well, she's got an interesting reward system. She says, quote, if I come downstairs and the kitchen is clean and you've done it all, you've done all the dishes, you've closed all the pantry doors, you better be ready to get your dick sucked. Yes, amen. Oh, wow. Thank amen, you, dude. That is fascinating to me that she would come out and say that. She's a big star, dude, Katy Perry. Yeah. Say, I'm just going to blow you to thank you and then spank you. And that is a direct quote. So uh, in case we had to censor that, she'll suck the D. She'll go down on her guy if he cleans the kitchen. And by the way, there's one tidbit in there that it stuck out to me. If you've closed all the pantry doors, is that a thing? Do people just leave pantry doors open in their kitchen? Oh, uh, my wife leaves every <laughs> cupboard open, every light on. I mean, uh, she leaves it uh, every uh, sometimes she leaves a faucet running and walks away, dude. Who's got time to close the door <laughs> to the cupboards, right? I mean, right. Yeah. No, some people work differently, but I did see her on video saying that. Did you see the video of her saying it? No. Is it pretty hot or is she being sarcastic? <laughs> no. I mean, she's being damn serious, dude, that, yeah, if you do that, you're going to get your D sucked. And she's letting you know, like, it's going to be great. Yeah. So. She said, quote, I mean, literally, that is my love language. I don't need a red Ferrari. I can buy a red Ferrari but apparently not a four-day housekeeper. Uh, just do the dishes and I will suck your D. It's that easy. Now, wow. I will tell you, women, if that is the standard you start setting, your kitchen will never be messy again. I mean, it is. I hate to say men are simple like that, but it is an effective reward system if you want your clean kitchen or whatever. That Mr. Clean must get his D sucked all the time, dude. That's why he's always smiling when he's got his arms crossed, nodding his head like, hell yeah, I know what's coming. Yeah. No, that's fantastic, dude. That Well, uh, that's my love language, so there you go. I used to say in my marriage, you tell me that you'll let me do any sexual act I want, I will go paint the house. Like, <laughs> literally, I'll go re-roof the house. And you know I did that once in a relationship. I'm up on the freaking roof, like, replacing tiles and stuff. And I wasn't even being bribed with that. But yeah, yeah I said, like, men are really not that complicated. I don't want to make sex a reward-based thing. But if it is, we'll pretty much do anything that needs to be done around the house. Don't you think that sex is a reward-based thing? I mean, it, it sort of is all the time, right? I mean, I, I understand that I, the woman is wanting to be loved on, too. I don't want someone who's just like, okay, I'll let you do this because you did that. But, I mean, your woman's not going to give it up when she's in an unhappy place, unhappy mood. So It should be equally rewarding, you know? It should not be a, a one-sided thing. But, yeah. I've also, I don't know that I've heard it go the other way. Uh, I would tell Kennedy, I'll go down on you if you clean the bathroom. Like, why not? I was going to do it anyways. I mean, <laughs> right, dude. Maybe that's another experiment, dude. Maybe we should start offering sexual pleasures for manual labor. Right. I don't think it's going to work that way. And that's just not fair. That is not a quality amongst the sexes. We should both be able to offer oral in exchange for good housekeeping. Yes. He has double standards. So, I don't know. Kudos, Katy Perry. And I did see Orlando Bloom sent out a tweet saying something like, kitchen's clean, I'm home. <laughs> you know? That's so funny. To quote that movie, uh, don't tell mom the babysitter's dead. Dishes are done, man. <laughs> it's a good 80s reference. So Yes. Yes, relationships can be complicated. Sometimes they can be really easy, though, ladies. I'm just telling you. Indeed. I also have an uh, article here on this uh, relationship topic that uh, I stumbled upon this week. Uh, these are essential habits that may seem dull, but are key to a happy relationship. I don't know if this is going to be quite as X-rated as what we were just talking about there with uh, the firework lady. But uh, I'm curious, Nick, if these are habits, do you think that we do, do our uh, women do it back to us or not? Uh, first one on the list, may seem dull, but key to a good relationship. Seems obvious to me. Regular communication. We all know communication is key. But it's not just about disclosing significant things. Consistent and open discussion about day-to-day -day life, the small things, creates a positive and safe environment, allowing both partners to be mindful of each other and know when something's going wrong. 
Yes. I mean, obviously, uh, that's the key to a good relationship or a great marriage, whatever the relationship may be. Communication is very important. Um, it's funny to see different couples in my life. Like, uh, they'll say, like, oh, how'd you bring that up? Or we don't really talk about that stuff. And I think to myself, like, you should be able to s- sit down with your partner and discuss anything. I really mean anything and feel comfortable about it and have a good conversation about it. That's not to say like it can't be emotional or heated at times, but you should be able to have that conversation. I think it's very important. That would be a huge red flag if you think there's a topic that you just couldn't talk about or would be uncomfortable or judged or whatever. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I sort of I've always advocated having the hard discussions. Like, well, I don't care what the topic is. Let's have the discussion. Like, let's get into it. Like, and that's important on that end of like the big stuff in life. But yes, the mundane, the little stuff, asking how was your day, asking, you know, talking about hobbies or how was uh, lunch with your buddy you went out to. Not only is it key to build a good relationship, but I also, I don't know what the hell you talk about if you're not just like, how was your day? What's going on with you? <laughs> like, you know, at some point in a relationship, you kind of know the big stuff or your, your history. Oh, yeah. I heard a really interesting guy talking, and I can't even remember what his name was, but I remember he was interesting. Uh, he was talking about, you know how you go to people who have been like, oh, I've been married for 70 years, old couples. And usually someone will ask, like, what's the secret to, you know, a long marriage? And uh, this guy was talking about it, and he was like, all these mundane things of, you know, even if it's taking out the garbage, if it's cleaning the dishes after we have dinner, these are the moments of everyday life in a relationship that actually make up the relationship. When you look back, like you remember the trip to Tahiti and you remember those big things. But when you were missing a relationship, wasn't it all those moments that you were like, yeah, I just want to have that, dude, where she comes home, you know, I make dinner for her, I draw a bath for her. Or whatever it may be, like the mundane shit of everyday stuff. Yeah, I mean that's truly having a partner in the world. You know, yeah. dating is one thing, but you dating is you know you carve out a day or a weekend and you just go with that person. Like truly intermingling your lives and uh, whether it's living together or just you know having this ongoing thing is yeah. I don't know how you you can't in the without talking about all these little things. Related though, I will also say the comfortable silence is also a good part of a good relationship. You don't have mm-hmm. to fill every freaking second but if that silence isn't comfortable that's also um that's weird too there's a little negative there and uncomfortable silences are always in the eye of the beholder yes that is a great point and you know what if you guys are comfortable with each other comfortable silence uh won't be uncomfortable you know like you should be able to just sit and not talk and still love each other from across the room exactly i remember being like in a car full of uh, dudes once we were all buddies and we were going somewhere and no one was talking and one friend was just like this is awkward the silence this is weird why is no one talking and everyone else was like we were totally comfortable and fine with it what's your problem <laughs> you know? right we're just chilling dude i feel very comfortable that's interesting yeah um do you also think when it comes to communication do you think timing it should and is a part of uh good communication in a relationship what do you mean? I'll give you an example. Uh, if I have something that I need to sit and talk with Rachel about, uh, like, uh, well, maybe I won't talk to her about it uh, right when she gets home from a long day at work. Like sure. picking your moments to have that communication. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. I mean, that probably applies to any relationship. You don't want to slam someone over the head when they first walk through the door. And, you know, the, one of the signs of being a good communicator is, are you going to get the conversation you want, the feedback you want? And part of that is setting up the conversation to succeed yeah. at the right time or setting. You shouldn't be stalling for weeks or months or years or whatever. But sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'll notice like sometimes, uh, I, and I'm sure everyone does, like sometimes I'll notice that Rachel may be feeling anxious or anxiety, uh, you know, just it's been a busy week or whatever. Like, oh, I'll bring that up when I know she's feeling a little more at peace with things i don't want to add to that it won't be productive right and you're not going to get the result you want either so yeah. and i will say too just on this topic of like having the 
little conversations, the big conversations. I, 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 in the old days, talked about this book a lot, The Seven Principles for Making a Marriage Work. And there's all sorts of quizzes in this thing. This is Dr. Gottman, if no one's ever read it. It's probably one of the better relationship books that, are, that is out there. And it's what tons of marriage counselors use as their sort of Bible. And yeah, there's a lot of quizzes in there, kind of trying to assess the state of your relationship and what areas you need to work on. The first multiple quizzes in this thing are all about just how well do you know your partner? Do you know their hobbies? Do you know their dreams? Do you know their fears? And I scored very well on those tests because it's like, how do you not have those conversations? How do you not know what your partner's hobbies are or aspirations are <laughs> or fears are? Like, you haven't had that chat with any of this stuff? Yeah, it's interesting, dude. I, I There are people out there that don't dive into each other. I mean, I, I couldn't feel a connection or closeness with, like I said, either a romantic relationship or just a friendship without knowing these things. You know, that's how you get to know somebody. Exactly. These are essential habits that may seem dull, but are key to a happy relationship. Uh, daily greetings. Taking a moment to say goodbye in the morning or hello in the evening might seem small, but it makes a big difference. And I will tell you, Kennedy recently pointed out to me that she really appreciates that I often in the morning, I'll just send her a good morning, a little sunshine, little yellow heart emoji, or at the end of the day, I always add, hey, how was your day? Like, to me, these are just natural things to do. But, you know, her ex didn't do it. This is something that was foreign to her, and I, I, that seems odd to me. Yeah, it, it seems odd to me, too. Uh, I know that even when you're busy, like uh, you're talking about sending texts because at this moment you guys don't live with each other. But when you do live with each other, those moments are just as important. You know, like, I want to know how you slept last night. I uh, I tend to walk Rachel out to her car when she leaves for work. And I realize that everybody can't do that because they're going to work or have to be somewhere. But I always think that's a great moment. You're saying goodbye to somebody. And you should think about the fact that it could be the last time you see him. You know, and that's the harsh reality of life. I hope that some people are listening to this. If you think to yourself, boy, I don't ever ask how my person's day was, or I don't wish them good morning. These are such easy things to do <laughs> that really do go a long ways and help with the relationship. So it's it's pretty short-sighted if you can't even bother to take the time to ask, how was your day? And you should care. Like, I, I'm, I'm not asking just to make her feel better. Like, I genuinely care, you know. Hey. Exactly. And that's why these seem natural to us because, you know, we're good guys. But uh, a lot of guys aren't. <laughs> uh, that's a fact. Oh, good. Certified. Essential habits that may seem dull but are key to a good relationship. Uh, check it in on each other. Might seem corny to receive texts from your partner checking in on you, uh, but daily check ins promote a healthy environment. It conveys to your partner that you love and you care about them enough to check in randomly. And, you know, we've got a, a fire burning here uh, north of where I live. It was cutting off a major highway. Like, one of my first thoughts this morning when I got up was I should check with Kennedy and make sure she got it to work okay. Or if I know she's got some meeting, hey, how did that meeting go? Is it okay? Again, these seem just common sense to me, <laughs> but apparently a lot of you don't do it because this expert's trying to get you all to do it. Yeah, it's interesting. I can't imagine, uh, I can't imagine going through a day of not either having telephone calls or texts just being like, How's your day going? Rachel probably thinks it's ridiculous. I find it fascinating to know what she had for lunch. And I ask her every night, what'd you have for lunch today? And I want an answer. <laughs> you know? Is there ever a wrong answer? Do you admonish her? For, <laughs> for no, something? but sometimes I'll be like, God, why'd you get that? Dude? You have so many options. I mean, she works downtown Seattle, so it's a plethora of great food. So I expect something good. Check in on your people. How about planning a budget together? This might sound crazy, but couples who regularly discuss finances, budgets, and individual purchases do better than those who don't. It, it, it's sort of an old cliche almost of marriage therapy that there are two things that couples fight about. Do you know what the two things are? Uh, I know one of them is money, and the other is probably, uh, well, maybe the kids. I don't know. What is the other one? Yeah, close. Sex. Sex and money Sex. are the two okay. most common things. And my old joke is there's never enough of either. You know? <laughs> never enough money, never enough sex. So those are the two most common things that people fight about. And, uh, yeah, you should be open and honest to be discussing sexual preferences and, yes, money constraints or budgets or whether you're planning a trip and when 
when I'm in relationships, especially and more so when you're cohabitating, where you are splitting bills and stuff, I would never just go out and buy some elaborate thing and not even think to run it by my person. Even if it's to tell them, like, I'm spending $1,000 on my dirt bike because it needs it. I may not be asking permission, but I still feel like I should be sharing that with you. A hundred percent, dude. I mean, just treat others how you would want to be treated. If You know, Rachel and I kind of have a, it's kind of an unspoken rule, but we've both acknowledged, like, we feel the same about it. Like, if I'm going to go out and spend the 200 bucks, I could go do it. I don't have to check in and be like, hey, just want to let you know. But if it's over that amount, like if I'm going to go spend 600, 1,000 bucks, like, yes, I'm going to have a conversation. There is a thing that I had been thinking of forever and ever that Saturday Night Live finally did a bit, a parody of, and that is the uh, December Lexus to remember or whatever. Ah, uh, yeah. This notion that you would buy a car for your significant other for Christmas. I always thought like, I don't care if it's my dream car. You went and bought a car without asking me? We didn't have a consultation. You bought a $50,000 Lexus and didn't think to talk to me. And SNL finally did a great bit about it. You can find it on YouTube. But yes, I always thought like, who I would be so pissed if you bought me a car for Christmas. I, I That commercial is so off base because in order to do that, you have to have FU money. You know, like you have to be so rich that that's a drop in the bucket. Not to mention, did you put my social security on the credit application or something? <laughs> like, right. like you finance this all by yourself? Where'd you come up with the money for the down payment? Like this causes more questions than it does Christmas joy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, dude. And where do you buy that bow? Where did you get that bow? It's funny. I actually had to buy an oversized bow uh, last uh, when I got the, the dirt bike for Crosby for Christmas. I got one of those novelty sized bows and they are a thing. Amazon? Yeah. Yeah. I think they're a thing because of those stupid Lexus commercials with the giant bow on it. So. Right. I think it'd be funny to buy like a little box, like a little ring and put one of those giant bows on it. So funny. Yeah, I love a big bow. All right. These are essential habits that may seem dull, but are key to a happy relationship. Referencing back to the Katy Perry thing, sharing household chores. If a person picks up more slack around the house than their partner, they're going to grow resentful and exhausted partners who share and rotate mundane household duties, whether just doing the dishes, dusting the table, whatever, create a positive environment. Now, I will I will argue that to some extent, though, what you're saying is is fair. That, you know, Rachel's a lawyer. She's working 80 hours a week. It just makes some amount of sense that you would pick up more of the slack. But y you still mentioned she she does some things around the house, right? I mean, yeah, I and I think that that's necessary only because, I, I you know what, I guess it's my love language for her to show that, like, oh, I'll do this once in a while. And it, it shows me that she appreciates what I do around the house, yeah. you know, stuff like that. This is interesting that this is brought up today. Uh, I was out yesterday running some errands solo. Rach went out and did some errands solo, and she came back. She was done a lot earlier than I was, and she was doing some things around the house. Okay, She went into our bathroom, and on our bathroom vanity that we both use, we have double sinks. Uh, I came home, and she was like, I cleaned the bathroom. And as I was walking in to go take a look at it, she I heard her mutter, my side. Uh, so I walked in there and I see that her side just fifty percent down is just beautiful and mine had not been touched, okay? It's hilarious. Uh what are your thoughts on it just out of the gate? <laughs> it reminds me of every eighty sitcom where they would like divide the room down the middle with a piece of tape. <laughs> yeah, Brady Bunch or well, yeah. Right. Um, well, I guess you're doing something to contribute to the house because I would have cleaned your side, too. So there's some level of contribution there. Yeah. Initially, I was like, you cleaned your side like you selfish bastard. Yeah. And I started would thinking you about her dishes and leave all her dishes. Right. Yeah. Like I would I would never do that. Right. But I started thinking about it and maybe I put too much thought into it. But I was like, oh, I guess I shouldn't be irritated because like sometimes when I do the laundry, I'll fold her clothes, but I won't put them away. And that's not because I'm wanting to be lazy. It's because there's a place for them, and she knows where she wants them. And I think maybe that's what she was thinking with the bathroom stuff. So yeah. I'm over it. Or she just knew her half was disgusting and decided that that was embarrassing for everyone. So Yeah, yeah maybe so. Yeah. And by the way, there's ways you can balance it, too. I, you know, in my marriage for years, I did the bulk of the cleaning, 
But then, like, my ex-wife would, like, pay bills or do some other household thing that I hated doing that. So it doesn't have to necessarily be an exact, you cook three nights a week, I cook three or whatever. Like, you know, right. you, you can barter on other ways, but there should be some balance going on to some extent. Totally. And uh, you got to find out what works for you. I mean, everything's different. Every situation is different. So just figure it out. This is all goes back to that communication thing. Like, this is something you could actually talk about. And then, oh, we're all good. Absolutely. You got to find some balance. And if nothing else, do the Katy Perry method. Like if he's going to clean the kitchen all the time, then you better get down and suck his D. So that is, <laughs> that is still doing a chore. It's called a blow job for a reason. Yes, it's not easy. Right. Uh, how about this? Um, I don't know if this applies if you don't have kids, but family meetings. These are uh, essential habits that seem dull, but are key to a happy relationship. Uh, regular meetings to discuss important family matters and schedules. Might sound like a boring way to stay connected, but it does wonders for the communication. I mean, definitely when kids are involved, you do need to be able to balance all the school stuff and sports schedules and everything. But I would argue even just, you know, you guys being, uh, you know, um, what are they called? Dinks. You got dual income, no kids in your family. So you guys still have schedules and you still go visit your mom or your cousin comes over. Uh, you go and visit your nephews. Like you still got to discuss all this stuff. Yeah, we still have responsibilities that we need to check in with each other on. Whether, well, like this weekend, we hadn't been over to my mom's. To, she loves a Saturday night dinner with us and uh, we love it as well. But we haven't been able to do it for a few weeks. And on Friday, I said, uh, we should probably go see mom on Saturday. We had that conversation and Rachel was like, oh, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. We haven't been for a while. So, yeah, there's uh, there's family meetings, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, this is all under that communication umbrella, if you ask me. Yeah. Uh, this next one, essential habits that may seem dull but are key to a happy relationship. Uh, mutual hobbies. Well, it's important to respect your partner's hobbies and let them do stuff on their own. I'm glad they pointed that out. Uh, it's a good idea to have some mutual hobbies. Now, you and I have discussed the definition of what a hobby is, and it seems like maybe you're lacking in some categories, but... I don't know. Do you guys have any mutual hobbies that you like doing together? Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, we like to go watch music together. Uh, we like to uh, go for hikes together. We like to play pickleball together. Uh, we have our, oh, we like to golf. Yeah. Don't you have like stand up paddle boards or kayaks or something you guys go do? Or? Yeah. Camping, paddle boarding. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. And we do it together and we also do it separate, which is like the article points out, I think, is it's important to have your own time and together time. And that's where you you can't blur that line. Great example. Dirt bikes are my main hobby. I, I freaking love them. And Kennedy has started to go ride with me because I've got a quad at the house. And I think that it's so cool that she will go out there on the trails with me and we can go ride together. There was a Saturday yeah. where she brought it up. Why don't we go ride today? And I, I wanted to I wanted to blow her. Like, thank you for, <laughs> for yeah. seeing that. That's so awesome. I'm a big skier. I love to be able to go ski with someone. Like, but Dirt bike is also something I want to do on my own. So you don't want a partner that's like, you know, will only let you do these fun things if they're doing it. So you, you, you definitely got to find some balance in there. I think it is important to have hobbies you can do together. But if you don't have if you don't have your alone time, you're not going to have a whole lot to talk about with each other outside of work that, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But like you need your own time to Talk about other things in your life, you know, or it can get boring. We've discussed that before. Healthy relationships does not mean you spend 100% of your time together. There should be guy time for you and me or the girl time or, you know, just you see your mom one time or whatever it is. Like, Yeah. Yeah. And hobbies are important. I, in my uh, mid-30s, ended up in therapy because my job as a general manager was stressing the crap out of me. And first thing that therapist said was, what are your hobbies? I was like, uh, I work, uh, pay a lot of bills. <laughs> oh my God. I had no hobbies. I had gotten yeah. away from dirt biking and skiing and all these things that I enjoyed. And it really is necessary to, to have things like that. Even if it's just, you know, what, even if it's golfing on a Sunday, like the good effects that have on you will ripple through your work life, your home life and everything else. Yeah. A hundred percent. You talk about like, uh, oh, you should have guy time, girl time. I also think, uh, it's important to have solo time. Uh, you know, you have that because you guys don't live together, but like Rach and I, it's funny, uh, uh as I'm preparing to leave for, uh, Omaha for, you know, near a week, I mentioned to her, I was like, are you excited? for me to be gone for a week and she was like yes right. and i and i didn't take that personally like she never she doesn't have much alone time at the house 
okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, I do. I have alone time all the time. So she can watch what she wants. She can eat what she wants. She doesn't have to check in. I was like, yeah, I'm glad you're excited, dude. I think I would be as well. So yeah, alone time's great, too. Is she going to sleep in the middle of the bed all week? Uh, I don't know, because we have a split California King. So, you know, like there's a little space where there's no mattress our mattresses are separate you know because they're adjustable oh i got you now you, we've talked about this when i was single of when you're single you got nothing but alone time and you miss the person sleeping next to you you miss yeah. having somebody to have dinner with but then when you're in a relationship yeah sometimes it's nice to have a, a night alone or sleep in the middle of the bed or whatever it is it's only nice though because it's uh, the exception to the rule not the rule you know yes hundred uh, percent. And the next one on the list is literally quiet time. Exactly what we just discussed, that everyone should have their own little quiet time. So totally agree with that. Uh, and then the next one is scheduling date nights. That is so important. When you're not living together, it is super easy because that's all you're doing is setting up date nights. And then those nights are just for you guys. But when you're cohabitating, whew, I mean, one of the big mistakes I made in my marriage was allowing it to become a roommate situation where we never set aside date nights and time together. We were just cohabitating. And yeah, you just basically are living with a roommate. So it may sound cheesy to schedule date nights or to schedule sex, but if you're a busy adult with busy lives, if you don't schedule these things, they probably won't happen. It can be really hard, dude, because you do get in a pattern of taking care of things. And like, these are the things that we do. We eat dinner, we watch TV, we go to bed. You know, it, it, it can be easy to get into that pattern. So even sometimes I'll think like, oh, hey, we should schedule a little you and I time. Well, we have technically you and I time. That's all we have. But we should have some you and I time to concentrate having some fun going out and doing something different getting out of the mundane you know schedule that stuff Uh, especially if you notice it's becoming a rut you know i mean maybe some people have that balance naturally but most don't so don't be afraid to schedule stuff it's just i've had people push back like it's not very romantic if we schedule sex but if you don't it often just will keep not happening because you keep being tired long days i got a headache i gotta be up early tomorrow like just schedule it and if you schedule it you probably down that cycle will not have to actually keep scheduling it that's a good point Uh, And you don't have to schedule it for a window like, oh, we're going to have sex at noon on Sunday. Uh, What I like to do is I like to uh, schedule a window from noon to nine. I could be poking you at any time, dude. So just be ready. I want that nine hour window. You're like the cable guy. I'll be there at some point between (laughs) noon and 8 (laughs) p.m. So just be ready. (laughs) Vagina. All right, the last one I'm going to share on this list, and then I'll throw it over to yours. These are uh, essential habits that may seem dull, but are key to a happy relationship. I had never done this before, so I'm a little on the fence how key it is, but I just had a good experience with it. Exercise routines. We all know someone who loves working out with their partner. Might seem excessive, but working out together is an excellent strategy to keep the romance alive. You're spending time together, you're working towards a common goal, maybe even a little friendly competition. I've never worked out with someone that I was in a relationship with, but I've done a uh, hot yoga a couple of times or no hot Pilates a couple of times now with Kennedy. And you know, it, it, it was part of my workout routine of that week. I did plenty on my own, but it was kind of fun to work out with someone. And yeah, you are sort of pushing each other a little, and it does feel satisfying in the end that you're both a sweaty, hot mess and you, you survived hot Pilates together, which is mildly torturous by the way. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Uh, This is something I got to get better at, dude, because I know Rachel asks it of me uh, and I've kind of shot her down so much with it. Uh, Not because I don't want to work out with her. It's because I just don't want to work out that uh, that she's kind of stopped asking. And I I need to get better at it because I know it's important to her. Like she would like me to help hold her accountable. Like when she comes home from a long day at work and she's going to work out at five, it's easy to see that wine bottle or the cold beer in the fridge and be like, "Eh, I'll do it tomorrow. So that's another way of holding people accountable. And it's something I'm terrible at and I need to get better at it. I think it is important. 
I mean, you talking about hiking together or, you know, paddle boarding together, that is a, a form of hobby and exercise to some extent, but, but yeah, I mean, actually doing a workout routine together, you know, I, I had never done it, but I, I did find it to be kind of fun and beneficial. So, and yeah, especially if you're struggling to get into a routine, you can kind of hold each other a little accountable. Like once a week, we're going to go for a long walk or jog or whatever it is. So ponder it. Yeah. It's something we used to do when we first got together. We'd go to the gym together and, uh, yeah, I've, uh, I, I got it in her pants and I let it go, you know, <laughs> you know, so I do need to get better at it. So, you know, it, it, it's easy to get complacent. I, uh, I recently was telling you that I had, uh, I gained a couple pounds over my ideal weight. I've been holding my weight in this very consistent range and I got a couple pounds over. I have like five pounds over and I've, I've dropped back down to where I'm supposed to be, not where I want to be, but where I'm supposed to be. But you made a comment of like, well, every new relationship, you gain like five pounds, right? You get a little complacent, you don't work out quite as much. And it's called love pounds. Right. Listen, there's probably some truth and benefit to that where you don't obsess on it quite as much, but I, I still want to hold myself accountable. And yeah, if you can go work out together a little bit. And I'll tell you, those yeah. Pilates, they were torturous, but I, I did it. I survived. It actually made me feel like, I'm doing okay. First time ever doing hot Pilates, which has yeah. a lot of core strength and exercises, and you're in a sauna. Like, literally, you walk in that room, you're sweating immediately. It's I, I, I'm surprised more people don't die doing, doing any of that stuff. I've tried hot yoga before, and it is uh, the hot's not real good for my crazy condition, but it's it adds a new element to it. I mean, it does make it harder, and it is good for you to sweat out some of those toxins you know oh yeah in my regular workout i dress head to toe i have a hoodie on a hood cover like i want to sweat as much as i can because it's cathartic and toxins and all that stuff but and if you do hot yoga right it might lead to hot yogurt that you can throw in her back. <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> throw on her back or her front. <laughs> bringing the habit uh, the habits together there so yes uh well those uh, it's a great uh way to look at some relationship things that we may be lacking in and should probably do more of uh hopefully someone gained something from it uh the article that i'm going to introduce to the vocal minority with nick and steve are things that mentally strong couples don't do according to one therapist okay mm -hmm. they don't ignore their problems that is a thing that, you know, sometimes uh, people can really get into the habit of just ignoring things because at the beginning of the issue, it's easier sometimes to just ignore it and hope that it goes away or hope that things change. Uh, but it doesn't. So you should probably jump on it sooner than later. It's a tricky one to some extent because I feel like a key to a good relationship is picking your battles. There are some things that maybe to sort of let go, but if there are things that persist or if that thing you think you can let go continues to poke in your brain for months or God forbid years down the road, it harkens back to what we talked about earlier. There should be no topic you don't feel comfortable talking to your partner about. So tread lightly, pick your battles, but when you feel it's worth you know talking about, you definitely should. Uh, some things, I think the distinction can be made that if I don't say anything about this, will it lead to resentment? And if the answer is yes, you need to talk about it. If it's just like, oh, I wish you took the trash out more, or I wish you did this more, like some, yeah, pick your battles, dude. Come on. Mm -hmm. uh, how about this? This is a list of things that mentally strong couples don't do. They don't keep secrets. Do you agree with that 100%? Secrets. A hundred percent. It. I guess it depends what your definition of a secret is. Like, is there things I haven't shared yet? I mean, there's got to be. Uh, is there something, though, that I'm intentionally locking away in a vault and I will never tell you about it? No. I, I just, I can't think of what that would be. Yeah. Yeah. I, I We read a story several months back about some... A uh, loan institution that found that something like 40% of couples are keeping a financial secret from each other. A bank account they don't know about, debt on a credit card they don't know about. Like that's yeah. an actual secret that you're trying to conceal. That should always be a red flag, whatever it is. If it's just something you're embarrassed about or you just, you know, it's not worth sharing or that's in my past. Like it, it, if it's not something you're consciously like, I cannot let this person find out that yeah, right. that's, that's obviously got to be a pretty big red flag. Mentally strong couples allow their partners to have 
privacy, like private social media conversations, but they refuse to keep secrets, like how much they spent on a new jacket. They share information freely, even when they don't know the truth might upset their partner because, well, they've invested in maintaining trust. So this doesn't mean you can't have some sort of privacy. Like, you know, I see this guy on social media where he meets a couple out on the street and he was like, you know, relationship tests trade phones and they start going through their phones you've seen it i'm sure um yeah some of that stuff like yeah i mean if rachel wants to look at my phone she could have full access to it there's nothing on there that i don't want her to see but she doesn't and i don't do it to her because yeah i hope you have some conversations on your phone where you're bitching about me to a friend of like gosh nick's being so annoying today or whatever those are personal private conversations that you can have in a couple yeah the old like don't let her read my phone that means you are hiding something it would be understandable if rachel was just yeah complaining to a friend you're a big enough person to understand that we all need friends to vent to or something but if you're obviously hiding a a separate you know bank app that you don't want her to know about or a conversation with some woman you know that that is obviously just a uh, blatant violation of any of that kind of stuff but but yeah, a little uh, grace period or a little wiggle room for some of these things is it's not a healthy relationship. What about uh, what about porno? Like, uh, if you could give a list, if there was a log of all your searches on porno, mm-hmm. would you give it to Kennedy to read through it without hesitation? Yes. There's a certain category of if you ask, I will tell. I have this old rule: I'll tell you anything you want to know. Just make sure you want to know it. Right, right. I can't be held accountable for the answer. Okay, you asked. But yeah, I'll share it with you. And something my therapist has reminded me of a few times, I often overshare too quickly. I have this guilty conscience of I got to tell you skeleton in my closet, whether it's something I, you know, bad that happened when I was a kid or a relationship thing. Misty always reminds me, people have to earn that trust. Something you share at three months in versus three years in might be completely different. And it's not that you were maybe hiding, and it's just maybe they haven't earned that level of trust. And by the way, we've lived long lives. There's, I hate it when somebody tells me, like, tell me a story. I'm like, that's too broad. Pick a topic. <laughs> tell me a story about a concert or something. I'll start telling you. But just, I mean, I got to reminisce on 48 years worth of stuff and just answer that question. Like, that's a lot. Yeah, no, I need specifics, please. Uh, These are the things that mentally strong couples don't do. Not stuff they do do, do to. They don't do. I try to avoid doo doo in relationships. I know some women are into that, but it's not my thing. Uh, this is this is they don't hesitate to set boundaries. This is something that is so important, and it could be uncomfortable. Do you set boundaries in your relationship verbally? It's a good question. I mean, you could set boundaries in a way where you're walling off secrets and whatnot, which definitely no. But I don't know. Do they list a good example of what healthy boundaries are? Uh, they create boundaries with one another. Like one partner might want to walk alone in the evenings. They also establish boundaries that protect their relationship from outside forces, like a meddling mother who wants to offer parenting advice or a friend who has to borrow money. They work together to set financial, physical, emotional, social, and time boundaries that help them be their best. So not only with each other, but with the outside world, like, man, I'm not going to let uh, Greg do that to us anymore. I, I, I'm struggling to think of an example with Kennedy. And again, it's, you know, we're six months in, so maybe we don't have the, the history yet for some of the boundaries, but, but this comes back to good communication. I am not a fan of ultimatums. So let's just say, and this isn't real, but let's just say Kennedy's got some friend that I'm annoyed with or whatever. I would never tell them it's me or her. You pick between me or your friend. But I may say, hey, listen, I'm just not a fan of Jane. So you guys go do your thing. It's fine. Like, I'm not going to tell you you can't be friends, but I'm going to draw a boundary that that's a girl time thing. And I'm going to respect that. What if Jane was uh, constantly trying to get her to hit on other dudes? Would you set a boundary of like, uh, it really makes me uncomfortable when you hang out with Jane. She's a bad person. Yeah. So that came up in my marriage. You may recall, you know, uh, Jamie had this buddy 
who was always in her ear about Steve this and Steve that. And you put up, I got divorced from my husband and everything's fine. Maybe you should think about this. Like, I think she was a contributing factor to the decline of my marriage because she was always in her ear, just, you know, sniping. And that to me crossed a line. So it did come up where like, why do you let your, we would meet out in public and that friend would come over and just ignore me. Say hi to Jamie and the kids and just not say a word to me. And I would tell her like, why do you let your friend dump on me like that? Why do you let, if Nick ever did that stuff to you, I would want you to tell me. And I would go to Nick and be like, hey dude, you're, you're complicating things. Can you just be polite to the woman or something? Like, like that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, that can cross yeah. a line. So you got to have some parameters, you know, of, again, picking your battles, I guess. Yeah, and that is a part of setting boundaries. I mean, uh, that's not a controlling thing. That is communication and setting boundaries in your relationship. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes you need to be called out for doing unhealthy things. Whether they're unhealthy to you or unhealthy to me, like sometimes we have to say, like, that doesn't make me feel good when you when you hang around with her or when you do that. It doesn't make me feel good. I don't like I don't like the person I become when you do that kind of stuff or whatever, you know, at least be able to talk about it. Boundary sounds negative. Maybe parameters is a is a better word or something, but you know, again, in my, my former life of being a married dude, it drove me nuts when I would text Jamie and she wouldn't respond. And I had to tell her, like, all right, you and I need a little uh, understanding here. Like, I know you ignore everyone else constantly because everyone tells me, I text Jamie, she won't reply. <laughs> like, right. Fine if you want to do that to her. But no, we're co-parents, we're married. Like, at least give me a thumbs up, acknowledge that you got it. I felt like that was a healthy boundary to draw because you're driving me nuts with not knowing if you're getting this or hearing it or anything else. You know? Yes, you know, that is completely appropriate. Uh, these are behaviors uh, mentally strong couples don't do. This is a therapist that said all this, so believe them for crying out loud. Uh, they don't become martyrs. While mentally strong individuals make sacrifices for the relationship, they don't insist on giving up everything to the detriment of their well-being. They refuse to become bitter and resentful about everything they do for their relationship. Instead, they set limits, ask for what they need, and take care of themselves as well. That's so important, dude, because uh, I heard a guy talk about one time uh, resentment are unspoken feelings. Are, is re That's the definition of resentment, right? You're going to have it. If you don't talk about it, you're going to resent. Uh, yeah. I mean, this goes back to the good communication thing, but this is something I probably am, am, am guilty of. For, for years and years and years, I thought that me being the martyr of the relationship, me always putting everyone else ahead of myself, I thought that that was a noble thing. I thought that's what a good father should do and a good husband should do. Always, you know, women and children first, right? Weren't we always taught that? Right. I took it a little too literally. And my therapist has clamped down on me pretty heavily about that. That it's one thing to be noble and want to protect everyone around you. But when you're truly sacrificing yourself for everyone else, if if they constantly want to eat at some restaurant you hate at, it's going to build resentment, exactly like you're talking about. So there's a fine line of being a martyr and noble and being self-imploding. And I, I definitely have been, I, I've gone too far the other way. Yeah, I think the distinction is, is there is a difference between, um, well, being a martyr and being unselfish, uh, of, you know, being selfless. There's a difference between being a martyr and being selfless. Hmm. That's pretty profound. And you're right. I mean, so much of life is about balance. And um, yeah, I think if you balance those two things, that it's probably the right answer. But I let the scales tip too far the other way. Easy to do. Don't, uh, don't fault you for that. But glad you got a little control on it. Hmm. I'm trying. Uh, these are all mentally strong couple things that they don't do. Okay. They don't use their emotions as weapons. God dang, dude. This one's so important and it can be an easy thing to do. Do you get what they mean by that headline? Yes. It's a bit of a slippery slope because sometimes emotions can maybe feel like a weapon to the other person, but there's no therapeutic added it, uh, therapeutic added. I don't know. There's no therapeutic philosophy <laughs> that emotions are not wrong. Your emotions are never wrong. What you do with those emotions, that can be wrong. 
In other words, if you're happy or sad or angry or something, those are just emotions. It's just how you feel. It's not right or wrong. But if you take anger and turn it into violence, obviously that's wrong. Mm, so interesting. And that's uh, that's all part of being emotionally mature. You know, it's not that uh, you should be able to control your emotions. Uh, you can talk about them but you should be able to control where they go. That is so true. Yeah. Um, it's the same as if, like, I'm really happy, so let's all go out to the most expensive restaurant in town and just live for the day. Like, that's a different thing, but that's also not healthy either. So the emotion is correct, what you do with it. It's the step between the two that is what therapy is really all about. How do you handle those emotions? Yes. Uh, for example, you won't catch a mentally strong person shedding tears in hopes their partner will stop talking about a difficult subject that would be weaponizing your emotions yeah. oh i'll cry to get out of this ticket or whatever Th that's a bad thing dude that's uh because i'm going to feed into that obviously so it's very manipulative for you to cry to get something from me people do weaponize emotions a lot and yeah that's the that's the error not how you felt it's just what you do with it that's right. Uh, these are mentally strong uh, couples that don't do these things. All right. This is if you want to be a strong couple. Well, don't do these things. They don't try to fix each other. This is an interesting one because uh, I, I don't think I could fix anyone and I don't want to be fixed. But at the same time, with love, nurture, support, uh, it is going to fix some things in me. And I hope that mine will fix some in you as well. Uh, what I think the author means by this, or the therapist, is that, you know what? You knew that I like to go to antique stores when we met. Don't try and fix that in me. Don't try and change that in me. But if I have a bad behavior based off something that might be an insecurity, like, yeah, I hope your love and support will fix that. Another classic therapy thing. Men often want to fix the woman's problem. The woman often just wants a shoulder to cry on or someone to vent to. And I have been guilty of this. And I always feel like, well, it's not bad that I'm offering help or I want to fix your problem. You know, I feel like my intentions are good. But yeah, a lot of women just simply want to be heard. They don't want you to fix their problem. The, the tipping point there that I realized in therapy, mistakes I have made before, the reason I have two fucking cats right now, is that <laughs> my ex-girlfriend had a problem with cats. She adopted one too many, and I offered I, I offered to take one of the cats for a few months. Like, let me take it to my house. And then we broke up, and she didn't want the cat back. I never wanted the second cat. Right. And the mistake my therapist made, because I told her, like, this was causing problems in her home life with her kids. She stressed out. So I offered to take the cat. And my therapist said, that's your mistake. You shouldn't offer it. She should have asked you. If she asked you to help out and take that cat, that's her looking for help, you offering it in return. You shouldn't just step in and offer to solve her problem by taking the cat. And now you got a hmm. cat for the next 15 years of your life. So probably won't forget that lesson again, will you? That's an interesting one, dude, because I can relate so much to what you did. Uh, I don't always want to have to ask for your help. This is something I will talk about. My, uh, I have somebody in my family who I know will do anything if I ask them. I would like it to be offered sometimes. I don't always want to have to ask. I would like you to see my situation and be like, hey, let me come over and help you with that, dude. So that's a that's a tricky one. It is. I mean, I guess the correct thing is you shouldn't put it out there and hope that they'll take it. You should put it out there and then say, by the way, I mean, could you help me with that? But I totally get it, dude. Like, I this is a, a core problem I've always had. I would do it at the grocery store. If somebody's like, I'm a dollar short, I would just say, hey, I got a dollar, man. Here you go. Like, I feel like that's a good, noble thing to do. But I understand yes. in a relationship why that it can become completely lopsided. You're simply trying to solve their problem instead of having good communication. And what you can do, by the way, it's not that you're offering help, but you can say, or you're not offering a solution, but you can offer help. So I could have said to the ex-girlfriend, is there anything I can do to help with the cat situation? And then she could have offered the solution. I just jumped right to, I'll take the cat. I'll get it off your hands. I'll solve this problem. Well, you know what? Uh, that's a great point. And my therapist, well, if she talked to you, she may um, 
she may tell you the same thing she told me. Uh, hey, Nick, you have a hero complex. You're always jumping in to be the hero, doing the doing the most drastic thing you can possibly do. And then you get into the situation and realize, oh, wow, I committed to a lot here because it makes me feel really good to be the hero, you know. Yes, I had that realization in therapy several months back. You know, I'm a big fan of superheroes, and I always look to them for good moral lessons about trying to do the right thing. Uh, With great power comes great responsibility. Sometimes that can be completely self-imploding because we're not heroes. I have this urge to take the bullet for someone, but... Yeah, boy, that's that can be all ultimately very self defeating, and you can take on way too much burden. Then you get stressed out. Then it comes out in other ways. Like you may think you're doing the right thing, but in the long run, it's not. Yeah, yeah, no, it's something to think about. Because when she told me that, I was like, mind blown. You're right. I do love to be the hero, and I get myself in situations where I was like, oh, I didn't think it was going to be this hard. <laughs> and society teaches us to try to be the hero, that the superheroes are the, the, the best amongst us. So you may have that urge of like, I'm going to do the good guy thing. I'm going to be the right thing, but God damn it. Ultimately, it may cause more problems, may, may do more harm than good. Yeah. I'll tell you what, it's, uh, there, a lot of it has shaped me because I feel like I got to follow through with it if I offered it. So a lot of it has taught me, uh, well, a lot about myself more than it has about other people, I guess. Yeah, it's tricky. We got time for one more. All right. Uh, we have been going over a list. These are things mentally strong couples don't do, according to a therapist. And this seems fairly obvious, but uh, I see a lot of people in public that don't know this. Uh, they don't communicate with disrespect. Uh, that's that's a big one. Uh, disrespecting your partner, your spouse, your kid. I mean, these are things that emotionally a brand someone and uh, what i mean by that is they will never forget these moments that someone they love more than anything has disrespected them whether it's to make a point whether it's to get a laugh whatever it is don't disrespect people you love dude that's a great point i mean the obvious example is the guy in public that's just berating his woman and you know that he's abusive behind closed doors and whatnot so that's pretty obvious but you just brought up a great one like making jokes at your partner's expense when um when jamie and i first started dating back in the early vocal minority days when we would all hang out at my house after the shows she started getting in this one of the guys thing and like you guys were kind of making jokes at my expense and she started jumping in and Mm. i boy that hurt i didn't find it funny at all And I had to pull her aside that night and be like, I don't want to be the butt of your jokes. I'm not saying we can't ever josh with each other or something, but or maybe even one little joke here and there. But she was just like hammering on me with you guys. And that was like, no, I I, you were supposed to be on the same team here. I'm not I don't want to be the butt of your jokes. Yeah, that's the interesting, dude, because it is it comes off totally different. Uh, if we're hanging out and, you know, I give you a couple of zings here and there, but if someone you sleep in the same bed with starts doing that, I mean, woof, that, that really hurts. You're supposed to have my back, whether you agree or disagree. That's my theory anyway. Like I'll always back you up. Exactly. And that is a fine line. Cause I don't want to create some perception. Like don't ever say anything that, you know, don't deride me in any sort of way, but, but yeah, you know, it, you gotta be careful with that stuff. Cause it, it is different. Coming from you, it doesn't affect at all. You know, dudes, you know, making little jokes at each other. But yeah, it hurts when it comes from, like you said, the person you're sleeping next to. So walk that yeah. fine line. Uh, thanks for joining us on another incredible journey. We call it The Vocal Minority with Nick and Steve. Yep, good stuff. Find our website, thevocalminority.net. Uh, but really, if you're going online for us, check out the social medias. Please comment. Please share this stuff. Uh, we're on all the the little ones, the the Twitters, the <laughs> the Facebooks, Instagram, the through. tinies, <laughs> uh, but, uh, YouTube. Uh, that's doing very well, and TikTok is our big one. We got thousands of people following there now, and videos taken off. So help us out with all that. Appreciate all the downloads, all the support. Leave a comment eight four four forty eight vocal, and we'll see you again. What up, players? It's your boy M. You're listening to two of the guys in the game, Nick and Steve, and the vocal minority. Stop worrying about mom spaghetti. And just make sure you're locked in every week. Peace, y'all. 313.